Okay, I'm going to turn on the recording because this is, oh, and there's Steve Milan with his actual live face. Thank you. So <laughs> this is Finance Friday. I'm David Worrell. That's Steve Milan, my partner next to me there. And it is uh, 12 o'clock on Friday, July 23rd. So we're going to jump right in. You may uh, absolutely join us on Facebook Live. Let me start that broadcast here. And uh Gosh, we, we do this every Friday or almost every Friday. I took last week off to go to my <clears throat> 35th high school reunion, so you didn't see me. But nonetheless, we talk on Fridays about all six of these cash programs that I just went over. And if you need help with any of that, we are here for you. Our online home is DIYCFO.biz. Customers have all kinds of, we have, a, we have a resource center out there. Steve, I think there's still 50 or 100 people who belong to the resource center and are, uh, we're trying to keep that up to date with news on all of the stimulus programs. We also list these recordings out there so you can review them. Uh, we put a little bit on YouTube and of course the Facebook Live has some recordings, but but all of our really great stuff is in the Resource Center. You can purchase that at DIYCFO.biz. If you already have, log in using the backslash. All right, here's the part that you guys have been waiting for. What's new now? We did some deep dives over the last, well, gosh, since three weeks ago, since I saw you last, there has been actually some news on almost every one of the stimulus programs. So I'm gonna go a little out of order today, but uh, if anyone here is a music venue or an amphitheater or a music festival operator, or even an arts artistic agent for a musician, you are eligible for the SVOG. And at first we thought that the SVOG had, well, the first day the website crashed. And then we thought, well, maybe they've spent all their money. It was kind of a, it was kind of a slow moving avalanche of money, but they have now given away uh, most of the $16 billion to the people that applied for any music venue that had uh, revenue decline of 70% or more. They were able to fill all of those applications and they still had money left over. So what I've learned just this week is that there's another $4 billion and they're gonna go back and give that money to the original applicants and to anybody who was denied if you file an appeal. So right now the appeals are going on. If you know anybody who's in the, the music business and the venue business, I would sure encourage them to uh, apply for this. I think, did we decide that applies to movie theaters, Steve? Anything that has a... Yes, absolutely, movie theaters. Movie theaters, yeah. So anything that has a floor bolted to, uh, a chair bolted to the floor <laughs> qualifies as a venue. <laughs> Okay, EIDL, we already talked a little bit about that, but this is probably the, I wonder if EIDL might be the largest program by dollar. Oh, Steve, <laughs> demerits. All right, EIDL is the disaster loan. And of course, you know that that'll be open until 1231, until December 31st. But uh, somewhere along the line, uh, EIDL got an additional $35 billion allocated. And so, They've taken that and they are giving away more of those uh, disaster grants. Technically, that's the EIDG, the grant side of this program. And uh, the only way to know whether you are eligible for these grants is basically to look in your email box because everyone who's in a low income zip code should have received a, an invitation to apply for new grants. And there's two kinds of new grants. The first one is a strictly a brand new $5,000. If you can show that your business was impacted by COVID to the point that you had a 50% decline in revenues during any eight week period last year, you can go back and get another 5,000 bucks if you're also in that low income zip code. And then they have this second program called the targeted advance, which says if you're a very small business, uh, fewer than 10 employees, then you got less than $10,000 in the disaster grant last year. And if you are in a low income zip code and have less than 10 employees, you can go back and they will top up your grant to make it an even $10,000. So uh, one of our clients, uh, Steve, I don't think you heard, Jackrabbit Toys got a $2,000 advance last year and they received an additional $8,000 topping them up because their warehouse is in a low income portion of New Orleans. And then they also got the additional $5,000 supplemental grant. So, 
wow, an extra 13, 14,000 bucks for a very small business made a very big deal. And, and you know what, Steve, we, Steve and I had this beautiful office in the middle of Charlotte before COVID hit and we gave it up. That office was actually, even though I thought it was a great office, that office was in the middle of a low income zip code. So moral of the story is don't, uh, don't write yourself off until you check. There is a list for who is in a low income zip code. And you might be surprised to find out that your office, your tax return address, your warehouse is in a low income zip code and you might qualify. Um, I think Jackrabbit Toys actually went back and asked to be considered based on the location of their warehouse, which is where their jobs were versus the tax return address, which was some post office box at a CPA practice or something. Okay. But um, uh, last, last time I tried this, David, yeah. even, even though the client had a zip code that qualified we couldn't find any way to apply without that email. Oh, is that right? Wow. And so were you able to find the email or to request it? No. Oh, wow. Very sad. All right. Well, so let's, speaking of that email, uh, search your website for targeted EIDL advance application. And here's the one that they sent to me. We didn't actually, uh, we didn't actually take any of this extra money maybe we should have but i just didn't feel like like we were deserving enough of money that was supposed to be meant for low income zip codes we anyway i decided not to take it but this is what the email looked like so uh i think everyone should stop what they're doing right now <laughs> and search your inbox for this phrase targeted eidl advance and uh, of course if, if that doesn't come up maybe do a broader search on everything from the sba but it may very well be $5,000 or as in the case of Jackrabbit, $13,000 waiting for you in your inbox. So, um, all right, what's next? Let's see, more news of things that are going on. So the SBA debt relief program, um, you know, there was one change to that, uh, not, well, I don't know how long ago it was, but it's very clear that the SBA debt relief is not taxable. And I, that's not something we've talked about before. So I wanted to point that out. You know, SBA debt relief just means that if you have an SBA loan or if you go get a new SBA loan before mid-September, uh, not only are there no closing fees on the new loans, but in any case, somewhere between three and 14 monthly payments will be made for you. Principal, interest, the whole ball of wax, the SBA is just going to make the payment for you to your bank. And uh, the important thing to know there is that, that is not taxable income. Be careful how you do the accounting entries from that. Do not put that down as sales or, uh, you know, any kind of, uh, don't co-bingle it with your sales so that you end up paying tax on that money. Pull it out, put it at the bottom of your P&L under other income. Make sure everybody knows and your CPA and your tax preparer all know that that's debt, uh, SBA debt relief money and therefore is not taxable. Okay, uh, restaurant revitalization fund. Wow, so they blew through $28 billion in about three hours. And as a result, 64% of applicants got zero because they simply ran out of money. There's a whole nother, there was a whole soap opera about how they distributed that money, but we won't go into that. Just know that most restaurants that applied for that funding did not get it. So yesterday, the uh, House of Representatives passed the, no, they did not pass it. They introduced, there's a big difference. They introduced something called the Entree Act, uh, stands for Entrepreneurs Need to Receive Extra Incentive Money to uh, Act. And it's, it would put another $60 billion to fund those uh, 200,000 applicants who did not get any, any money before. Now. The interesting thing about this is it was Republican led and you know, Democrats are all for this kind of stuff. Democrats will give money away till the cows come home. Uh, Republicans are usually against giving them money away. But in this case, this bill was led by a Republican who said, hey, there's enough money left over after the CARES Act from all these other places, uh, shuttered venue operators, the disaster loans. He pulled pieces of money from all over and he found an extra $60 billion to give to restaurants. And so we're hopeful that uh, this will be a bipartisan thing and get through and, uh, and restaurants will have a little more money 
because boy, were they hit hard. Some of my favorite restaurants are just not there. In fact, Steve, did you know Harper's at South Park Mall? South Park Mall is a beautiful mall, one of the one of the most wealthy zip codes in the three state area. And uh, Harper's was a beautiful restaurant related, I think, to the Houston's chain. And uh, uh, yeah, anyway, great restaurant closed, completely dark. Couldn't have lunch there yesterday. Too bad. Uh, okay, so that's restaurants. Well, and, and anybody who's in the restaurant business who would like to help in trying to get this passed, um, the Independent Restaurant Association is circulating a petition. Go to the website, sign your name saying restaurants ought to get more money, which I think for what it's worth, I think they should. They've had a tough, tough time. Yeah, yeah, crazy bad. And, and it's still bad. I finally found a restaurant that was open. We went to an Applebee's for the first time in a hundred years. I think I've had two Applebee's meals in my whole life. And uh, uh, they didn't have anybody working. There was hardly anybody there. And they said, I know that we've only got five tables right now, but we can only serve four. So if you wouldn't mind having a seat, <laughs> they literally had one chef, or, you know, one cook and one, one waiter and one bartender, and they were struggling to keep up. So uh, yeah, it's a sad time for restaurants. Man. Okay. I promised everyone on this call that we would talk about the ERC and the PPP, and that's what we're going to do. So quick review of what's brand new in these programs. Um, we're going to go in deep, but the, the quick news for our new segment is that the ERC is still open. That goes through the end of this year. Uh, if you are applying, I'm calling in real time, right? If you are applying for the tax credit using your 941 forms, you can expect to get cash back in about six weeks. If you are applying for the credit in prior years, it's taking six to nine months. Do not, do not expect fast turnaround. Do not use the 7200 form. That's a specific form that says, here's a way to shortcut in line, to, to cut in line and get your money sooner. No, it's, it's not. It's a big disaster right now. 7200s are handled manually. Uh, there are not enough people working at the IRS to handle all of this. So do not use the 7200. And the good news is payroll companies are starting to figure this out. Steve, you and I used to bash the payroll companies because they just couldn't do the ERC. But yesterday I was online at Gusto and they have a very nice looking form where you go through and even if you have a PPP loan, you tell them how much your PPP loan was, which payroll uh, uh, periods you used the PPP for and Supposedly, they do the rest of the calculation. Now, it's, it's not clear whether they will go back in time and file the 941 X's, but they're, they're trying. <laughs> they're trying. <laughs> so, so our, our, yeah, our own experience with that, um, of course, is that our payroll company was a disaster and figuring it out. Um, but we're coming to the end of our covered period for the PPP loan. We're going to need payroll reports. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens next week. Uh, because I think they assigned every eligible, every dollar that was eligible for your ERC, they assigned it to ERC. And whatever was left over should be available for the PPP report, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be very interesting in it. And that's that's one reason why I wanted to do Finance Friday today, because this is such a crucial moment in the in the stimulus programs and the ERC and the PPP. So let's cover the PPP real quickly. Of course, you know it's closed, right? You can't get a new PPP loan. Uh, and repayment has started. That means there are some people out there who got the PPP one, the first round, so early that they are already at their 16 month mark and having to pay back their loans. If that's you and you haven't filed your forgiveness yet, boy, you got to jump on it because uh, as we've seen, the PPP repayment amounts can be huge. We were talking to uh, Robin earlier who got a, just a $70,000 PPP loan but in round one, they only had two years to pay it off and we've already used 16 months. So you're left with just eight months to pay off this. I mean, you, maybe you think of that as a small loan, 70,000 bucks compared to some of the millions of dollar PPP loans. It wasn't very much, but $70,000 over just eight months left to pay it back is a eight or $9,000 a month payment. So, uh, I, you know, I'm 
I'm predicting some real heartaches and headaches uh, when the banks start taking repayment from you because you haven't filed for forgiveness. And by the way, something like 1 million small businesses still have not filed for forgiveness on their first round PPP. That's astounding to me. Have we filed for forgiveness for first round, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, we filed and we got it. Okay, um, there you go. But, but you're absolutely right about that deadline. As a matter of fact, we have a client who has a rather large loan working with PNC. It was a complicated situation because they got more than they were supposed to on their PPP one. Uh, but PNC wrote to them to say, you, you need to get on with filing your forgiveness application. We got finally got squared away what the over advance was. You need to get on with filing your forgiveness application because in 30 days, we're going to have to start getting paid. Right. And if, if they had had the, so, so they have the choice of paying back the full amount <laughs> or at least making payments on the full amount or filing forgiveness and making payments on the smaller overpayment amount. Right. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and they surprisingly were, were given the choice to pay back over two years or five years. Mm. Um, so, uh, I mean, the, they were given a good option, but the, the window is closing. If you've got a PPP one, you haven't filed for forgiveness. Right. I can't think at this point, I can't think of any reason not to do it. Yeah, that's right. For a long time, we told people, wait, 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 slow down, slow down, slow down. And now it's uh, now it's a hurry up offense to get it done before the payments begin. All right. If you're still using your second PPP two, don't forget that that will be ending soon. Ours ends uh, ooh, this week. Most people's ends at the end of this month or beginning of next. So check your head count. Remember that you're supposed to have the same number of people today at the end of your PPP2 as you had on February 15th of last year or some other checkpoint period pre-COVID. But anyway, you're supposed to get your head count back up there. So check your head count. Um, and if you just want to talk about PPP over dinner table, you should know that $800 billion supported 11 million companies and saved 90 million jobs. Uh, 12 billion of that 800 went just to sole proprietors. 1.1 million sole proprietors got 11, an average of $11,000 each. So I, that's Uber drivers and hairstylists. I got my hair cut today, finally, after about six months. And uh, my stylist was very pleased that I had helped her apply for the PPP loan. So I know that there are some hairstylists who, who got sole proprietor money. And uh, anyway, I think that the overall program was a very interesting experiment and probably deserves to be called a success for saving 90 million jobs. That's, you know, that's something, right? Uh, um, so, so David, on that second point there, I think it's really vital to talk about if your covered period for your PPP2 is not over, yeah. now's the time to do, just like you do year-end tax planning, now's the time to do year-end PPP2 planning. That's right. Uh, and especially if you are participating in the ERC, because you've got to make some decisions about what you're going to do with uh, payroll for the ERC and payroll for the PPP. You've got to make some decision about non-payroll expenses uh, and uh, headcount, right? If you want to try to uh, fit into any of the safe harbors. So um, now's the time to jump on all that. Even though you may not be ready to file for forgiveness, make those last minute adjustments, payments, payroll corrections, whatever right yeah very good uh and we've got some we've got some tips on that particularly as it relates to the erc so why don't we get to that right now um there we go employee retention tax credit so you may know this goes all the way back to the original cares act but it became available to people with ppp in uh, the economic aid act and was extended even further through the end of this year uh, during, for the rescue America act, which I think was February of 2021 when, when uh, rescue act happened, that was under the new administration. Okay. So what is the ERC? Just in case any of y'all don't know yet, the employee retention tax credit 
wants to pay you for keeping employees on the payroll last year and this year after after the pandemic. So um, this year, well, in total between 2020 and 2021, you are eligible for up to $33,000 per employee that's on your payroll. You claim this money by using your quarterly payroll tax forms, the same forms that you have to file anyway. You simply add a line to them and say, yes, I qualify. Here's the amount of money you should send me. And not only do you get to keep the taxes, the payroll taxes, that's FICA and FUTA uh, that we call payroll taxes, but not only do you get to keep those payroll taxes, you also get to hold on to the employee's individual withholdings for uh, any amount that is less than your total ERC tax credit. And if the ERC tax credit is more than even both of those things put together, you get cash back. So. It's a huge, huge program for Steve and I. This amount of money was greater than our PPP. So you can see that during two or three or four quarters of this year, you could get back more than uh, more than a few months worth of payroll. OK, the only thing you got to do to qualify is have fewer than 500 employees in 2019 and show that your revenues have declined versus 2019 or that you had what's called a suspension of business. And we'll dive into both of those things right now. So here's the details on how you qualify and how you uh, and what the benefit is for the employee retention tax credit. Let's go to the middle column there, 2020. When this started, Congress said, look back for the whole year of 2020. And if your revenues declined in any quarter by 50% compared to the prior year, 2019, then you should be eligible for a fifth for 50% of the gross wages you pay to any employee up to $10,000 for the year. So in a capsule, if you had less than 100 full-time employees in 2019, you kept some of those people on, you paid them at least $10,000 during 2020, and COVID smacked you in the face and you had a 50% reduction in any one quarter, you could file your 941s or amended 941s to get back 5,000 out of the first $10,000 you paid to each employee. So that's pretty cool, right? It's worth 5,000 bucks. Even if you're the only employee, it's worth $5,000 if you were on payroll. It only applies to people on W-2 payroll, actual employees, just like the PPP. It only applies to real employees. Okay, the uh, rightmost column there for 2021, now it applies to all four quarters separately and your revenue to qualify only has to decline by 20% compared to the same quarter in 2019, pre-COVID. So if this year you are still suffering by as little as 20% in revenues compared to pre-COVID, and you had fewer than 500 people on payroll in 2019, you're now eligible for 70% of the gross wage that you pay to each employee, up to $10,000 in wages per quarter. That's $7,000 per quarter per employee or $28,000 per year per employee if you qualify for all four quarters. Let me, let's do that funny logic right now at the very beginning. Here, this is how you qualify, but how you continue to qualify is even more interesting. Once you qualify under either of these two rules, you automatically qualify for all following quarters until the end of the quarter in which your revenue exceeds 80% of 2019 levels. In other words, you always qualify for at least two quarters and you will continue to be qualified so long as your revenue is impacted, as described here, 20% below 2019 levels until the end of that quarter when it exceeds that. So you always get one more quarter than you think. We got three quarters. That was amazing. And a lot of money. <laughs> and it was a lot of money. Um, so before I go any further, I think we should, uh, gosh, we're getting some notes in the chat window that says people can't hear us, but Wow, Rick says my microphone is showing muted. 
Rick, I hope that that's worked out because every, I believe everybody else can help me, uh, can hear me. Uh, MCC Financial says, can you help with filing the forgiveness on the PPP? Yes, uh, we'll go through we'll go through that at the end. Um, okay, everybody hears me fine. Thank you for that. Let <laughs> me get back to the question and answer. <laughs> Uh, the question and answer says, uh, Hang is here. Hang's our old friend. She's been on every call for the last 18 months, I think. She gets our frequent flyer stars. And she says, have we seen anybody who has uh, gotten an ERC credit based on the suspension of business rule versus the qualitative? So maybe that gives me a chance to show you one more slide here. Uh, there we go. What is suspension of business? You can also qualify for the ERC on the days that your business was suspended, meaning if the government order shut you down and you were therefore unable to, to conduct your business, but you went ahead and paid employees anyway, you can use those days that you were shut down. And I got to say, Steve, I, I have not personally seen anybody successfully do that yet. Have you? No. Oh. Okay. We, we certainly have clients who are trying it. We did not volunteer to be their uh, uh, cheerleader <laughs> on that, but we pushed them off to a much larger CPA firm and you guys are welcome to try them out. That's called Aprio.com. If you think you qualify under this, I just think it's a, uh, used to call it a long run for a short slide, you know, or maybe said another way, the juice ain't worth a squeeze. I think you'd end up documenting the bejeebies out of your situation and applying to SBA or to uh, IRS and using this, but maybe not actually getting very much benefit out of it if you were doing it uh, honestly. Now, the interesting so, thing is, sorry, so go ahead. This, there was such a huge difference in the what, what, what needed to qualify for 2020 and 2021, right? 50% decline in business. There were just a few industries that met that. Yeah. So we... And we, as you say, we thought we had short periods of time where we might have been able to qualify on the partial suspension of business, but the amount of effort to document it and the amount of money we might have gotten in 2020 just didn't seem like it was worth it. Um, 2021, the requirements have greatly lightened up. Now it's a 20% uh, reduction compared to 2019, right? And we had some big, some quarters in 2019 where we did big projects. So uh, uh, we fortunately had not needed to try it. Right. But it it's, seems like a monumental undertaking to prove. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. I'm, I'm not really a big fan of that. Um, okay, here's another ERC question. So Mr. Wright says, hello, was there, uh, was there an issue we are supposed to watch out for in applying for PPP forgiveness so that we don't kill our opportunities for the ERC? Well, I just couldn't time this any better. I have got that exact answer on my next slide, which is don't double dip. So yes, this is the key strategy here, uh, right? Which is each penny of payroll. <laughs> and we, we typically bring it down to the dollar level, but anyway, each penny of payroll can go into either your PPP forgiveness or can be used to qualify for the tax credit. But you can't do both. You can't take the PPP money and say, yes, I spent it on payroll and then have the government reimburse you for that payroll through the tax credit, right? You can't get paid for the same payroll twice. We call that double dipping. Don't double dip. So the way to get around that, oh, and by the way, this only applies to PPP and ERC. Um, if, if, you, if you really stretched and you are a company who used the work opportunity tax credit or any other tax credit that was on payroll, those are also not allowed to double dip, right? You can't use two tax credits for the same dollar. But don't worry about it if you got a loan or a grant. So the disaster loan has nothing to do with this rule. The SBA debt forgiveness has nothing to do with this rule. It's only government programs that focus on payroll. That each payroll dollar has to go into one program only. And uh, this should be tip number one. <laughs> but tip, uh, tip number one actually is use a spreadsheet to figure this out because mm -hmm. timing, tip number two, timing matters a lot. 
And we've got a simple little spreadsheet that we can send to you if you will email me at david at diycfo.biz. I will send you this spreadsheet. It's really very cool because what you see here is I had one employee and I paid David uh, April, May, June, July, August, September. I separated it that way because it's by quarter, right? So to do this double dipping calculation, you've got to separate, you got to show each pay check by person and then by quarter so you can figure out how much of David's pay is eligible for PPP and how much is eligible for ERC, put it in two different columns. So at first I just said, well, let's do this the easy way. I'll just use everything I can for PPP. There's the $20,000 for David as an as a owner of the company that he was eligible for PPP. I took all of that during the first quarter and then I put everything else into the second quarter. Well, guess what? That wasted over $10,000 of David's salary because we maxed him out in Q1 and only had $3,000 left for ERC. And then we maxed out the ERC in Q2 because it's only $10,000 per person. And we had uh, $14,000 of wasted payroll There you got no benefit at all during Q2. If instead we had moved some of that up or maybe I should say over from left to right during Q1, we could have taken uh, $5,000, sorry, $6,000, $7,000 of ERC credit during Q1 and still maximized everything out. And the difference was over $5,000, over $6,000 of credit. So timing matters, organization staying organized, keeping it on a spreadsheet matters a lot. Um, Let's go on my next tips. I don't see any other, shoot, where's my other tips on here? I think I lost a slide in the negotiations there somewhere. Yeah, I sure well, did. Back on tip number two for just a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah let me go back to that. Okay. Uh, this kind of clarifies the comment we were making about what the payroll companies are doing because uh, you started the year, you said to your payroll company, sign me up for ERC. They started reporting all of that money going to ERC on the 941s. Then you get to the near the end of this period and you say, no, this isn't going to work. In order to maximize my benefit, I needed to use some of that money in ERC in the first period, in the first quarter. Uh, and it's just really going to be interesting to see what, what kind of payroll report you're going to get in order to make your case when you file for forgiveness on your PPP. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Okay, here's my, uh, I think I got this, the slides back in order now. Let's see if my next tip comes up. There we go, tip number three, uh, give raises or bonuses, right? The, the PPP covers the first $100,000 of salary pro rata for 24 weeks, right? That's $46,000 per person. The ERC covers up to $10,000 per quarter per person or $40,000 salary equivalent. So just simple math says, wow, during the period that they overlap, if you find that that's you, if you've, you're still using the PPP and you qualify for the ERC, the maximum benefit is going to accrue to you if you pay everybody in your company the equivalent of $140,000 a year salary. <laughs> so I'm not suggesting that you pay every janitor $140,000. And in some places, that would create a real problem, like California, where once you give a raise, you can't take it back. <laughs> but you can think of creative ways to give more money to your existing employees, because if you don't pay them enough you're gonna waste this opportunity. And of course the PPP is a dollar for dollar. The ERC is, I'm calling it 60 cents on the dollar. It's really 70% of what you pay, but then you have to pay regular income tax on the money you get back. So the, the ERC is a taxable tax credit, which means that uh, every dollar you pay an employee that gets reimbursed by the government, you're gonna get about 60 cents uh, value for that dollar you spend on payroll. So you can see $100,000 base uh, salary rate for employees under the PPP, up to $40,000 base salary rate per year per employee for benefit while you're using the ERC. 
And if they overlap, that just creates a, a huge opportunity to spread the wealth around a little bit and, and pay some more people a little bit more. The tip that's out of order here is hire more people. <laughs> Should have done that the other way around. Hire more people, pay them more money. I mean, that's what this is all about, right? This is these are stimulus programs to get your to to get your employment up. The, <laughs> we've had this discussion before, haven't we, Steve? Where the whole point of the CARES Act was to make the private businesses in charge of unemployment benefits. <laughs> Right. They took unemployment away from the states and they gave it to you and me to try to keep people employed, to pay them more. So hire more people because, number one, you have a minimum headcount you have to meet with the PPP to avoid headcount penalties. There's no headcount limitation on the ERC. You can hire up to an unlimited number of forty thousand dollar a year people and get. 70 cents on the dollar back from each one of those people that you pay your wages to. Uh, remember that, you know, the, the limit on the benefit is that $40,000 salary or $10,000 per quarter. And maybe what, as, just as a strategy, a, a cost saving strategy, maybe what you want to do is hire some interns, uh, put some people who were 1099 employees, put them on payroll, uh, hire your spouse, Hire the spouse of some of your employees. Hire some children. <laughs> I don't know. And I will say that, that blood relatives, parents, grandparents, children, grandchildren, aunts and uncles, anybody who you can say was a blood relative by, by birth, marriage, or adoption in your family uh, does not qualify for the ERC. They do qualify for PPP. So if you're still spending PPP too, bring those people on give them a job, give them a salary, give them a wage that, that helps you qualify for the PPP uh, headcount penalty reduction and uses that PPP money that otherwise is going to go to waste. Doing that will also raise the, you know, it'll, it'll use all that PPP money so that people who aren't related to you, their salary can be used for the ERC. I mean, it's just an astounding amount of payroll dollars that you have to spend in order to maximize your benefit. And of course, put your businessman hat on. You only wanna pay payroll dollars if you're gonna get a business benefit out of this, right? I'm not suggesting you go hire your dog or the homeless guy under the bridge, but if you, if you can imagine a way to put people to work to improve your business today, now is the time. Now is a once in a lifetime opportunity to hire, 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 and raise wages for the people that you do hire. And, you know, it's no wonder that it's no wonder that new employees are demanding such high wages because there are a lot of folks like me who are paying people more because the government's telling us to do that. So double-edged sword, maybe. Well, I think, um, you know, as you said in the beginning, this obviously worked, right? 90 million people were put to work. It, the most convoluted, complicated process that you can imagine, but it worked. Uh, but but the tip about you know paying bonuses and so forth um, has sort of two thought processes for me. One is the government's going to pay basically half of any any uh, bonuses you hand out now. Uh, why why would you not? And secondly. Competition for, I mean, it's really getting hard to hire good people. So from a really selfish point of view, you want to keep those folks around. Uh, this is the time to, this is the time to hand out those bonuses and, and hire, you know, business, the economy is expanding, the other stimulus stuff is working, people are buying more, uh, and we're, we're certainly expanding and hiring more people, so uh this is the the whatever you called it in the beginning a pivotal pivotal moment a pivotal it's a crucial moment in time i'll tell you what uh yeah it's a crazy perfect storm or a collision of events i don't know what <laughs> we can make a, a movie about this i don't know <laughs> hey i wanted to point out in the chat window we'll have a little quick commercial break uh, William Vassell says, thanks for talking about the targeted EIDL grant earlier. 
I just found the SBA's email in my box and submitted the application. I've got $5,000 more money coming today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, William, you made my day. I hope we made your day. I hope you get that money. Uh, that's, that's awesome. That's why we do these things to spread the news because this is important stuff. And uh, yeah, just, just can't say enough about spreading the word and telling people what's going on. Um, Patience asks if we'll be recording this, and of course we are recording it. Uh, it will be recorded and, and housed on our Facebook group. I'll also try to put it on our resource center, maybe even the YouTube channel because, uh, because this is important. And you can always uh, email me for slides and a link to the recording. So email me, patients, anytime, david at diycfo.biz. I pasted that in the chat window just now. Um, okay. So, oh, here's a couple of questions about ERC. Cindy says, a reduction in the third quarter for 2021 compared, so I qualify for ERC by showing a reduction in the third quarter of 2021, comparing it to the third quarter of 2019? That's her question. And the answer is yes, you absolutely understand this perfectly. That's exactly what we're saying. Pre-COVID to today, pre-COVID to last year, pre-COVID to this year. You're always comparing to pre-COVID. So the same calendar quarter, because remember, a lot of businesses are cyclical, right? Retailers say that they make half their money at Christmas time. So you don't want to compare uh, January when sales are low and you got a bunch of returns coming in to December of last year when sales were high. So you're always comparing to the same calendar quarter in 2019. And if you had a reduction in sales of 50% during 2020, you qualify. If you had a reduction in sales of just 20% this year in any one quarter, you qualify. So, all right. Um, let's see. Yeah, Cindy says there has to be a reduction of 50% from the same quarter in 2019. Yeah, just to reiterate. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, okay, I think I think I got the chat window caught up. Cabbage, Steve, do we have any clients who are using Cabbage? Um, Harold says Cabbage keeps saying that the revised forms are not quite right. Well, Harold's are probably our one Cabbage customer. We know Harold well. He says Cabbage still says they're not ready to accept the forgiveness applications. That is crazy. Um, it is crazy, but I was just thinking about that. Um, so what that, it seems to me what that would mean is they don't have the EZ or the S forms available for the forgiveness application. Um, so the worst that could happen is you would be forced to use the long form. Uh, there is no alternative. You, as far as I know, you can only apply for forgiveness through your bank. Um, so use whatever they have on their platform and forge ahead. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, I, and I think Cabbage is not even open, period, right? They're, they're just um, not, not accepting applications. Well, then you can't forge your head. No, I, <laughs> no, I just said that I was reading it to say they don't have the revised forms. Oh, well, yeah. yeah, that's right. Certainly the forms were revised, and certainly it did make it easier Yeah, if you qualified for the S or the easy. But if they don't have it, then just do it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me go back to Q&A here. Things are building up on us. Um, there were lots of questions about PPP and what it can be spent on. You know, PPP has to be 60% payroll, but the other 40% can be qualified non-payroll expenses. And the only things that are qualified are rent paid to a third party. Can't be paying yourself. I can't pay rent to Steve and call that a rent expense because it has to be a third party landlord, utilities paid to the utility company, phone, electric, gas, water, whatever, uh, software, they call this operating software, any software that you need to make payroll, to uh, do customer service, you know, your CRM, your Microsoft Office, your LastPass, password manager, all that stuff, uh, whatever cash you pay for software during the covered period counts. And yes, somebody's question was, can you pay 12 months in advance? Yes. If, you, if that's the standard software terms, you just pay that and a, the bank is gonna look for the canceled check or the transaction for the software. Um, you cannot 
prepay rent in advance, right? Standard rental terms are month to month. And so you can't prepay rent, but software, gosh, lots of people sell software by the year. If you want to pay for it during your covered period, that is a qualified expense. Okay. Um, all right. So we, uh, we answered that. Uh, we answered Lawrence about the recorded session. I, I don't usually send an email out just to tell you that I've got a recording, Lawrence, but uh, you can certainly watch for it and find it on YouTube and uh, Facebook and call, uh, email me back. Um, Robin asks, what happens after a company has been forced to close and they still have their EIDL? Wow, if you have a disaster loan, which is a 30 year loan and it's non-forgivable and you close, I'm gonna say you will, if you have not paid that loan off, I'm gonna say you will end up going through a bankruptcy like proceedings. Some judge is going to have to rule on your assets and review your wind down Steve, you know more about turnarounds than anybody I know. How does that work when you just want to dissolve the company, but you still owe a loan? And in the case of EIDL, we know that it may not have personal guarantees. So let's just talk about, you know, the, the business owes that money. Business doesn't have the money to pay it. They want to just close up shop and go away. What happens next? Um, I'm hesitant to give an answer because it seems like there's so many variables. Do you have a personal guarantee? Who made the loan? Yeah. Uh, as we've noted before, the SBA has no sense of humor uh, <laughs> about, about uh, forget, forgiving loans. Yeah. So I think you need to talk to your tax advisor. There certainly um, ought to be a non-bankruptcy process by which you could tell everybody I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think there is. It's a, I mean, technically you are bankrupt, right? You are insolvent. You owe more than you own. You don't have the cash to pay off these loans. So, and, and it's going to vary by state because I have done this in California and uh, California says you can file to dissolve the company before you actually pay off your creditors. And then you come back and you just have to attest, I've paid off all my creditors and the company is done. In North Carolina, you are not allowed to file for dissolution until you can say, I've checked the box, all of my bills are paid, I don't owe anybody, and then your company is done. But so it is going to vary by state. Steve's, of course, right. He knows too much about this to give you a simple answer. Fortunately, I'm not burdened with all that knowledge, and I can just tell you, <laughs> go to a go to a lawyer. Um, it, you you said tax guy, Steve. I don't know. I think somehow I think a lawyer who's a like an incorporation lawyer might actually be better. Some a bankruptcy lawyer, um, but a CPA probably you know a, a good a good tax guy might have dealt with bankruptcies before. That's a real specialized area of law, though, right? Unwinding a company that is upside down. Uh, not everybody's bag. Certainly, I haven't done it more than once before. So, yeah. And, and of course, sole proprietors would be in a totally different situation than C corps and S corps. And uh, yeah, yeah, sole proprietors. That's an interesting one. I don't, we could have a whole three-hour conference on that one. <laughs> All right, let's go on. We got a bunch of questions. P Zone says, "I have a question regarding EIDL. I understand it cannot be used for to refinance existing debt, but it can be used to pay fixed debts, including my commercial building mortgage. If my current mortgage for my business was refinanced externally, is that monthly payment still considered a fixed debt and therefore a valid and legal use of the EIDL?" Yeah, yeah. I'm going to say yes because I'm not burdened with <laughs> too much knowledge. <laughs> but I think that you know the meaning of the of the terms and conditions on your EIDL was don't go out and pay off some big mortgage with this money, and don't go out and buy a piece of property with this money. Don't go buy a Lamborghini or a home or a, even an office building because you're putting yourself in more debt when the government's trying to give you money to tide you over, right? If you're simply using the money to make mortgage payments on an existing note, great. That's keeping your business afloat. That's the good use of money. Uh, if you had already refinanced prior to receiving the loan or 
or whatever, yeah, I think you can use the loan to make payments. I think we should also stick in here. This is an SBA 7A loan. We've never seen an audit on the actual uses of SBA 7A loans. You got to make decisions that are in the best interest of your business and just be ready to explain them in case of an audit, in case there is an audit. But we, we've not seen the SBA be very meticulous about following up on these things. Yeah, and this is a case where we shouldn't give advice, but will anyway. Yeah. Uh, so these are small loans, right? Maximum half a million dollars. And the there is no SBA police uh, who's going to spend time investigating thousands and thousands of these small loans to make sure that the money was spent. Right. So I think you're right. Don't buy a Lamborghini, but if you have some valid business expense, yeah. keep your business afloat, keep people employed. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Anonymous says, I don't qualify for the ERC because my income did not drop, but what are the guidelines again about applying because of she's calling this capacity capacity reduction. So is a 10% reduction okay? And where can I see the guidelines in writing for this? So uh, Anonymous, you are looking for what's called the, sus the suspension of business rule. So you could Google ERC suspended business and probably read all day about this. Uh, we did have the actual word count on a slide here. Let me see if I can get it back up. It's right before this one, right? There it is, whoa, 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 come back. Sorry, when I'm broadcasting and trying to Zoom and PowerPoint all at the same time. There you go. So due to order, if your business was suspended due to orders from an appropriate governmental authority, limiting commerce, travel, or group meetings for commercial, social, religious, or other purposes, and your business was impacted by at least a non-nominal amount. And then the SBA went back and said, non-nominal means at least 10%. So if you're, if a portion of your business, which represents at least 10% of your income was impacted by an order from someone at the governor level or above, not your mayor, not your city health director, but the governor of your state or the federal government, then you may uh, qualify for the suspension of business practice. And they give us some examples. Uh, for example, the non-essential closure of all non-essential businesses. If you're non-essential, obviously that impacted you. Um, an emergency shelter in place designation, meaning that employees could not come to your work unless they were essential. So that would be a, a impact or a suspension. And finally, a curfew. They give an example of Trader Joe's that is open all night long, 24 hours a day, uh, and they have a curfew, then Trader Joe's was more than nominally impacted. And uh, they gave a second example that said, well, what about Trader Joe's, who's not open 24 hours a day? There is no curfew, but they only can let 25 people into the store at a time, and they have to make everybody else wait outside on the sidewalk. That was a no. That's a not a suspended business. If, they, if your business had to actually close, um, a great example is restaurants, right? Restaurants who had to close their indoor dining were more than nominally impacted and can apply for a sus for the ERC based on suspension of business. So that, that's the big one right there. Restaurants clearly qualify for suspension of business and you can file for, I suppose, all of your payroll wages during the, any period that you can show a suspension. Okay. Um, Harold wants to know if there's any place else that he should go. Since Cabbage is not accepting my applications, is there any place else I can go to file? And Harold, uh, the answer is no. However, there is that link in the chat window that says the SBA might open a uh, different, uh, different portal. All right. Uh, Sally says, for the 50% reduction in, in um, revenue, let's, let me put that back up on the screen here. For the 50% reduction in revenue, during 2020, is that collections or billing? And Sally's a medical office, so we might be collecting for prior quarters, which would throw this off. Sally, the answer is it's the same basis that you pay your tax. So for us, collections means cash basis, right? You're actually getting cash in. Billing means accrual basis. You're realizing revenue when you bill for it. And the answer to this is, always, they always point to your tax return and say, if you file a tax return on a cash basis, like 
99% of businesses do, then we're talking about the collections, the actual cash that you deposit in your bank. If you are a, an accrual tax filer, then I think you're talking about the billing. And uh, I, I, you know, you, you also have to, for accrual, you would also include any uh, charge-offs or write-offs from a medical office. If you are not going to collect something, you would be allowed to write that off during the same quarter. So that's on an accrual basis. So yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer for you specifically, but it's based on the same as your tax return. Uh, Mary had two questions. Here's one. Uh, she, Mary has a C corporation and owns 100%. She's an employee. Can she claim up to $10,000 of my salary per quarter for the ERC? Steve, that's a softball. You want that one? <laughs> I'm sorry. I was reading the one about the LLC. What's the... Okay, I, I'll take the softball. Softball says Mary was, a, was the only employee of her C corporation. So yes, Mary, your salary of up to $10,000 per quarter uh, qualifies for the ERC. So you can get 7,000 bucks back for the, uh, uh, sorry, if you're filing in 2021, you're worth $7,000 per quarter. If you're filing retroactively for last year, it's $5,000 for the whole year, right? Okay. Um, Michael says, what do you know about refunds of 2019 employer taxes? We sent the 941X in April and have not received our refund yet. Wow, April of 2020, and you are waiting 16 months for the refund. I, I think what you're saying is you filed the 941 in April of this year for prior periods that happened during 2020. And that, that makes sense, right? That's chronologically correct. What we are hearing, what the SBA, or sorry, what the IRS is saying is that this could take up to nine months, and I'm going to guess maybe longer for people to process the nine, amended 941 returns. That's the 941X, which is the quarterly payroll form that you file to get the uh, tax credit, it can take up to nine months to process. So yeah, Michael, um, stay patient, my friend. That's, that's a long time to wait. Um, he goes on to say, my lender has been holding up the process of, holding up the process of submitting forgiveness applications for PPP. They claim they are waiting on the final rules. Should I be pushing them to submit? You know, I, I'm not sure. There might be some weird little rules that are happening between the SBA and the banks right now, but these guys ought to get their crap in gear, as we say. Uh, I think most of the delay on lenders part has to do with technology. I think they're afraid that you're gonna crash their website and they're going to lose data until they've got just a, a really robust website rolled out. And so they're waiting for their website to be done. That's my guess, Michael. So just be patient with them. You, they know it's their fault. You know it's their fault. So no worries, right? All right. Joe Happel says, I was on your last few calls. And you said to stay tuned in regards to lack of supply chain without sales dropping in reference to ERC. Yeah, that's an interesting one, Joe. Uh, what we're talking about here is the suspension of business. And there is a there is a point of this law that says if your vendors were suspended and could not get you the raw materials so you could build your widgets, you could claim that time. You paid your employees during a time when COVID caused a suspension of business. I, I think that's valid, but if I were you, I would use a very large and reputable CPA firm to claim that. It's going to cost you a little bit of money to prove it. Um, but if, if you've got a lot of money on the line, it's worth exploring that and, uh, and finding it out. So it is absolutely a valid excuse if you're we're, either your supply chain or your customers. We're even saying, hey, we sold to medical offices and medical offices were closed. Therefore, my whole sales process was suspended for two months while I continued to pay my salespeople. And so therefore I should be able to claim the wages as ERC credits. I think it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a gray area. It just takes a lot of, a lot of thought, a lot of documentation, Joe. So keep your documentation in order. Yeah, and I think you, you wouldn't want to try it on your own. You need a pro who's been doing this, who knows the right buzzwords and, 
Yeah. Because it's a bit of a hard sell. Yeah. The weird thing about all of this is, so far, the IRS is relying on you to self-qualify. Stephen, do you know of any position where, other than just checking the box on the 941, where you show anybody what's actually happened in your business and say, here's why I'm suspended or here's why I qualify? I mean, we don't have to report our sales anywhere to prove that we qualify. You just check the box and say, yes, I qualify. Please send me my money, right? Yes, my expectation is just like filing your income tax where you self-qualify. Yeah. They can come back and argue. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, of course. At a later date. Yeah. So doc- the IRS has no sense of humor either. <laughs> Documentation is key. I certainly don't want to encourage anybody to make this stuff up. That's true. All right. Linda says, are there any reasons why you would not want to apply for the ERC, particularly if you have a payroll company? Uh, Linda, I I can't imagine any reason not to apply for ERC. It is a crazy good program, once in a lifetime sort of opportunity. Um, The the, the problem with payroll companies, and Steve and I like to beat them up, is that they don't necessarily know, for example, who is a blood relative of an an owner, a 50% owner. So those people are not qualified for ERC and they may not know that and they might count them wrong. Second thing is you might not tell your payroll company until mid quarter, in which case they've missed the first two or three pay periods during your quarter. And so they might not calculate that correctly. And the third is they don't know that you had a PPP loan. So it would be difficult for them to calculate which payroll dollars are going to PPP and which to ERC. Now, having said that, I did use Gusto and they've made a very good attempt to do it. And I felt like they got close enough. They got about 80, 90% of accuracy and to do the next 10% was going to be an awful lot of work. So we just, we hit submit. We did the 80% actually hit submit. We'll see what they say. I suppose the one possibility is if you you had a PPP and you didn't have enough payroll or struggling to get enough payroll to get full forgiveness on that, you'd want to take care of the PPP first. But I think in general, if you didn't reduce staff, you're going to be okay on the PPP. You yeah. should get, go yeah. for the EOC. Yeah. If you had the revenue, if you met the revenue decline. Yeah. Hey, here's a here's a really good one. Uh, Matt is the owner of an LLC. My, uh, my wife and I take a salary based on business sales because of how our LLC is set up. Every accountant tells us that we do not qualify for any forgiveness, loans, or whatever. COVID almost killed our business. What are your thoughts? Matt, I, you, haven't given us, you haven't given me enough detail to be sure, but I think I disagree with the advice you've gotten. First of all, everyone was qualified for the PPP and the forgiveness of the PPP, even sole proprietors, you know, uh, Uber drivers, even LLC people, uh, people who own an LLC like Steve and I even partners in an LLC, LLCs taxed as partnerships, even partnerships qualify for the PPP and for PPP forgiveness. So absolutely you should be digging deeper and sending me an email about the, about the PPP forgiveness. We can absolutely help you with that. Um, in fact, let me just put this slide up here. I do have, uh, there you go. You can email me, David at DIY CFO. Uh, Tammy, for some of you who know, she's the ERC queen. She helps us on some of the ERC things. You can you can email her also, but uh, I prefer you call me first. Um, so my one question there would be: um, Are those W two? You say you're taking a salary. Are those W two wages? Exactly right. So to be clear, PPP forgiveness is just based on company ownership or wages, but ERC is based only on wages. You have to have W-2 wages being paid on a paycheck with withholding, filing the 941 quarterly tax form in order to claim the ERC. No reason you couldn't do that now. You could put yourself on payroll right now and claim the ERC for fourth quarter, maybe even third quarter. So that's a strategy. If you are a LLC, and you want to file to be taxed as an S corporation and put yourself on payroll, you could do that. Um, let's see. 
yeah, Elizabeth. <laughs> Elizabeth says, what's my email address? There you go, Elizabeth. David at DIY CFO. How much penalty from anonymous? How much penalty is assessed if you don't keep your head count? Is it taken out of the loan total or the payroll amount portion? This is a PPP question, guys. If you don't have the same number of people employed now as you did prior to COVID, the PPP reduces your forgiveness by that same percentage. You had 10 people before COVID, you have eight people now, that's a 20% decline in headcount. 20% of your PPP loan might not be forgiven. The math's a little more complicated than that, but, but they are going to reduce your qualifying payroll by 20%, by the same as the headcount. So it's, it's important to try to keep that headcount up there. And of course, it's not just the number of people, right? I assume that's what you're alluding to. There's really FTEs, not just heads on the payroll. The, the calculation that, of the, that's right. Yeah, you want to talk about FTEs? How do how do you calculate FTEs, Steve? Um, there's a you, you have two choices. One is that you know look at the hours work, compare that to 40 hours, take that as a percentage. So somebody works 30 hours, that's 0.75 as an FTE. Somebody works 20 hours, that's 0 0.5. There's also, you have the choice of using a simplified process where everybody's either a one or a half. Uh, and if, if you don't want to go through the math of all the hours, that's the easiest way to go about it. Right. Uh, or, or call us. Yeah, well, of course. Mike has a good follow up exactly on that point. Is that headcount penalty? Is that for a specific date, or is it an average over the entire period of the loan, the twenty-four week covered period? Can we add people just for a week at the very end to make our headcount number work? The answer is yes, actually, Mike. Uh, the the I guess it asks it asks it both ways. It says, "What's your average headcount for the whole period?" And if you don't qualify, it says, "Well." that's okay. Did you bring everybody back to work for that last couple of pay periods or that last one pay period during your covered period? And if you can answer yes to that, you avoid the penalty. So we have done exactly that. We brought a couple of people back just to beef ourselves up on the last pay run of the covered period. We're going to try to keep them, of course. That's ethically what you need to do, but, uh, but that's certainly how it worked for us. Um, Okay, a couple more quick questions. It's after one o'clock. I appreciate everybody sticking with us. Uh, know that we do perform both PPP and ERC calculations for people. We can help you with all of this stuff. And you can find out more by just simply emailing me, david at DIYCFO.biz. Um, check out our website, DIYCFO.biz and see all the goodies that are there. A couple more quick questions before we go to lunch. Steve, you got, you got time? Sure, let's do... Uh... You want to set a number? Three more? <laughs> okay, three more. Um, Jack is a little confused. He says, does PPP forgiveness require a reduction in revenue? No. PPP forgiveness is not based on a reduction in revenue, Jack. PPP forgiveness is based only on the payroll dollars that you actually spend during the covered period. So completely unrelated. What you're thinking of is, qualifying for the PPP2 required a 25% reduction, but that's ancient history now. That either happened for you or it didn't. So forgiveness is not related. Um, David Rain says, if you wanna give bonuses to your employees, assuming you're done with your PPP, is there still a benefit to give bonuses for the ERC? If they're already making $40,000 per year in salary, is there any benefit to giving bonuses? Uh, David, the answer is no. So Bonuses, I was suggesting that you use bonuses to bring people either up to that $40,000 per year salary level or to uh, use more money for the PPP so there would be money also available for ERC, right? I mean, just more money. But once you've reached, if you're, if you're not in your covered period for PPP, then the $40,000 per year salary maxes people out for the ERC unless you've just hired them, right? We just hired a woman yesterday and during third quarter, she may not reach $10,000 in salary because there's only one month left of third quarter, right? July, July and August is gonna be the end. So maybe we wanna give her a little bonus um, 
during August so that it maximizes her personal salary available for ERC. And in fact, we did exactly that. Uh, all right, is this my last one? I got to pick a good one. Um, boy. <laughs> um, if a company acquires another company, can the buyer omit those employees when calculating FTEs for 2019 for the ERC? Holy mackerel, that's a, that's a crazy good question. Um, so to qualify for ERC, you have to have had fewer than 100 employees in 19 for, to use it for last year, fewer than 500 employees in 2019 to use it for this year. If you've just bought that, if you've just bought a company, are you obligated to use the combined payroll in 2019 to qualify? What do you think, Steve? Any idea about that one? Uh, I think my safest answer is uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've been we've been applying for everything else on an aggregated basis, so I'm tempted to say you should count all those employees. Uh, just because the ownership changed doesn't doesn't change the fact that there were more than 500 employees, although they were two different entities. Maybe if you could show that each entity on its own was fewer than 500 employees, you'd be okay. Uh, and, and it may depend on how the acquisition occurred. Um, was it a stock sale or asset purchase? Everything, you, you are right. Everything else we do, you have to create a pro forma so that the before and the after are on a apples and apples basis, right? But yeah. uh, in this particular case, I don't don't really know. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, 110, uh, my voice is sore already. Um, I thank you for wasting another hour with Steve and David. I'm sorry that we didn't get to questions. There's still uh, almost 200 people on this call and there's still 35 unanswered questions. I do hope that you will email me those questions. I will do my best to stay up late tonight and get you an answer back. Uh, there are some good ones in there. I'm sorry we didn't have time to explore them all, but I hope you at least got your eyes open to this, uh, this ERC opportunity because boy, it's a big opportunity. And why are my slides going crazy here? I don't know, but uh, it's a big opportunity. It's a little bit tricky to mix the ERC and the PPP, but it can be done. I've got a free, uh, Excel file for you to help. And if it's still too much for you, we are here to support you on that and all of your accounting and bookkeeping and finance strategy needs for your small business. So hope you'll keep us in mind. Contact me anytime, David at DIYCFO.com. Steve, thank you so much for coming. Always a pleasure. Come back next week, folks. All right. Bye now.